Eddie, who posts as The Eddies on YouTube, which includes Eddie and his father, I think. That reminds me of an old TV show called The Courtship of Eddie's Father. That starred Bill Bixby, who will later become The Incredible Hulk. Well, actually, Lee Ferrigno was The Incredible Hulk. Bill Bixby's character was the straight character on that. He also played as a straight character in a TV show years earlier called My Favorite Martian. Anyway, Eddie asked me how Lycoming could justify $40,000 for this engine. And that's a good question. There's nothing really modern or high-tech about this engine. Almost all of the engineering that goes into this engine was developed in the 30s and 40s, perfected in World War II, metallurgy and the fuel formulations. I don't know when this particular model of engine first came out, but the same crankcase has been used for uh, probably 70 years or so. There's nothing high-tech about it or anything. There's no close tolerances in the engine when you dry set the lifter clearance, the valve clearance on it. It's between 25 and 80 thousandths. Ring gap on it I think is like 50 thousandths. I don't know, it might be a little bit more than that. But anyway, it's a big wide ring, ring gap. Oh, it's got to be that way because it's an air-cooled engine and the engine heats up and expands quite a bit. And there's different metals in there between aluminum and uh, steel. So you've got to make up for that ex heat expansion when the engine warms up. And of course this engine is designed to run at 75 to 80 percent power full time where an automobile engine is only running probably 25 percent power on the highway maybe even less than that except for a racing engine or a, a heavy duty truck engine or heavy machinery engine something like that that those are all built to higher standards than your normal car engine so basically there's not a whole lot of difference between that engine and this engine over here which is another four-cylinder, horizontally opposed, air-cooled engine. And there were little, literally millions of these made. This was a Volkswagen engine and is also used for power plants on all kinds of different machinery and equipment. Uh, this one's a little more expensive than a standard Volkswagen engine that you'd stick in an old Volkswagen because it's been modified to fit a thrust bearing on this end of it to drive the belts and stuff for the sawmill. But most of the internal parts and everything, except for what the crankcase has been modified, are all standard Volkswagen parts. I can buy four cylinders for that engine for a couple hundred dollars. And one cylinder for that engine is about $1,300. So, why the big difference in price? Well, you might think because of the specialized training that the mechanics that put the engine together and stuff have, but that's not necessarily true. Aviation mechanics do have specialized training. They have to go through two years of apprenticeship or school, and there's a rigorous training in that. And then there are rigorous tests that they have to take to, to get their license after they've been certified in the school to take the test. But aviation mechanics that work in the aviation field itself only get about $30 an hour, $40 an hour, something like that, in less than that in a lot of places. Guys that work in an auto shop actually make more money than that. In fact, a lot of the big auto shops were sitting outside of the A&P schools when the guys had graduated out of A&P school and hire the guys right there to go to work in it as an auto mechanic. And like homing, which is a manufacturer and a certified repair station. Uh, certified repair stations don't necessarily have to hire certified mechanics to work in them. In fact, years ago, they tightened up the requirements for welfare, and uh, Cessna and Beach uh, restarted production after a long hiatus of production of their airplanes, and they hired a lot of women and uh, people that had been on welfare that were completely untrained to work building their airplanes. So it's not necessarily because you have to have a bunch of highly trained, highly paid specialists to build one of these engines. That doesn't add that much to the cost of it. So what does? Well, one of the things is all of the parts that go into one of these air engines or into airplanes in general or certified airplanes in general have to be specifically produced for aviation. They have to be tested and certified and there has to be a paper trail all the way back to the mine where the ore was first excavated. Now a lot of the parts can be exactly the same parts as you'd buy for an automobile or a boat or, or anything else, but they have to be inspected and go through rigorous testing before they're certified as an aviation part. 
So that's one thing that adds to the cost of the engines. But one of the main things that adds a lot of expense to aircraft parts is product liability. Oh, and Cessna was building airplanes in the 1970s. A Cessna 172 would sell for, say, $15,000. In the early 80s, they would go for $25,000. Of course, there was a lot of inflation that happened through the 70s and into 1980. But say in 1980, they'd sell one for $25,000. In 1981, they'd have to sell one for $26,000. In 1985, they'd have to sell one for $30,000. Primarily due to the cost of product liability insurance. The Cessna started building airplanes in the 1930s, and they had to maintain product liability insurance on every airplane they ever built that was still licensed and operational. It got to the point where the cost of liability insurance exceeded the cost of the airplanes themselves. As they couldn't sell any airplanes anymore because you could go out and buy a used one two years old or three years old that had low time on it for half the price of what they could sell would sell a new one for. Well, it's the same way with the aircraft engines. Uh, you gotta have product liability on each one of these engines or each one of the parts that goes into the engine. Every, every job or everybody that makes it a different part from one of these still has to buy liability insurance for the part that goes into this and then you have to accumulate all that together into the engine and the engine manufacturer has to have product liability for that too. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why the cost of the engines is so high. Another reason is there are a lot fewer of these engines built every year and sold than there are, say, an equivalent automobile engine. So there are basically millions of the Volkswagen engines out on the market or out in the world. There are a whole lot less of these engines. When an automobile is made, there there are millions of them made and they can adjust the cost of that over millions of automobiles where you have to do it a lot less on, on an aircraft part or an aircraft or aircraft engine. And one of the other reasons is because they can, because there's no competition for them. If you're in the experimental end of the aviation spectrum, you can do almost anything. For general aviation, piston engine airplanes are pretty limited to either Teledyne Continental or Avco Lycoming. And Teledyne Continental bought Avco Lycoming, so they're all one big company now. But there used to be other, more engines on the market, uh, Ranger engines. They were in a lot of different airplanes from the 30s through the 50s. Uh, Grumman Widgeons had Ranger engines on them, and there were some other airplanes that had Ranger engines on them. Uh, Franklin engine, there's quite a few airplanes that had Franklin engines on them, Stinson's and, and some others. Rotac has become popular engine. Uh, I think they may even have a certified engine now, I'm not sure, but that became popular. They were snowmobile engines and they were popular on ultralights and now they're going into the home built market more and more. And then of course Volkswagen engines and people have modified Chevy V8s and motorcycle engines and all kinds of things like that into airplane engines, but that's in the amateur uh, experimental field where you can do just about anything you want. But in a certified airplane, you're stuck between certified engines. Anyway, they've got a lock on the market. So that's why they cost so much. And that's the same with all the parts and pieces on there. If you go to buy parts and pieces for, say, a lawnmower or an automobile, they're a certain price. If you go to buy parts for a racing engine to modify an automobile for racing, then they're going to be more. If you go buy RV stuff, it's more expensive yet than automotive stuff. Uh, marine stuff is think more stuff is tacked onto it, and then of course aviation stuff is even higher than that. For example, the magnetos on here they have to be inspected every 500 hours. I sent my spare magnetos in to have them uh, gone through, and it cost me 800 bucks a piece for the just just for the overhaul for the magnetos. I just ordered a new oil cooler. If I'd have bought the same brand oil cooler as what was on here, it would have been about 600 bucks. I bought a new oil cooler that's still certified, but it's a different brand. It's 300 bucks. The alternator, alternator kit, when I put that on there, that was 600 bucks. The starter's about 600 bucks. Any alternator that's put on there is basically just a, a little alternator that comes off of a, like a Kubota engine or something like that. Anyhow, that's kind of why aircraft stuff costs so much, why they can justify the cost of that engine. Just for grins and giggles, I just opened up the carburetor box to take a look at it since I had it out in here. 
and there it is. There's a brand new carburetor. That thing's as pretty as a little girl in her Easter dress. Nice. Nice and shiny. And I got kind of a surprise. I opened it up and they got exhaust gaskets in there and they're the thick kind, the good kind too. Usually they send these cheap stamped gaskets and new nuts for them. And here's something I didn't expect at all was these baffles here that go in through the engine baffles or grommets, whatever you might want to call them, for the spark plug wires. The ones that are come off there were fine, but got new ones of those and then new ADEL clamps and all kinds of stuff. There's even screws there, longer screws there for the rocker box covers to screw those uh, these clamps into. Anyway, that was pretty neat. Doing one of the hardest things on work on the airplane, and that's cleaning up some of the parts that got to go back on it. I took all this stuff and had it soaking in some paint thinner for a few days while I was doing other things. And I just dug it out, cleaned it up, brushed it up, and I just disassembled all of the primer lines here to get down to the basic pieces here. This is one of the copper lines here. I threw all the steel ones away because they were rusty, but anyway, here's uh, all the pieces of the primer lines here. These are the primer injectors here. I've still got to clean those up. And then these fittings here. This one I'm not going to need. This is for the breather tube. I'm not going to need it because there's one on the engine. And this and this are for the oil cooler line. Of course, they have the engine mount bolts here. Looking at these engine mount bushings, these holes here are pretty elongated and egg-shaped here, so it was definitely time to change them. And my carburetor air box here, carburetor heat box, that was kind of grungy because I'd sprayed it down with corrosion block. Um, and of course it attracts dirt and stuff and gets discolored. And a little bit of rust showing in places there where the paint didn't quite get on it or something. So anyway, I've got that cleaned up nice. I might spray a little bit of paint down in here where I didn't get it before. But actually, once I got to cleaning it up, it looks a lot better than what it what I thought it did. Went to town to try to get some pieces for the primer lines to put them together, check them out. I ordered this line here the other day. This is some stainless steel tubing, eighth inch, and I wanted to try to use it. Now before I got some uh, eighth inch stainless steel, but it wasn't the right size. It was metric. Couldn't get it to make the flare fittings and stuff like that. But I got a compression fitting on there put on and I just uh, put it on to check it out on one of the nozzles, the spray nozzles, and it works great for that. So anyway, use a compression fitting on this end and then you use a flare fitting where it goes into these T's to make up the primer line. So I think that's going to work out okay. And it's a good thing too because I had assumed that I could get the parts that I needed here in town, but I went to the hardware store and they didn't have any 8th inch copper tubing and they didn't have any of these ferrules, compression fittings, for the ferrules for the compression fittings. But I got some at the parts store and I got all they had there, so um, I got 8 of them I think, but that should be enough. I only need 4. I thought I needed more because I thought these use compression fittings, but they use flare fittings in them, so that's good. Anyway, we're getting some of that stuff cleaned up. You say that takes time and uh, elbow grease and it's not something you want to pay somebody $100 an hour to do. So I got to pick this engine up to set the primer lines on there and to build those. I took the housing for the oil screen off. This is the housing for the oil screen. And uh, this is where the oil screen goes in here. Oil temperature probe goes in here. Well, I took that off and I put the adapter on it for the oil filter. I uh, put a new gasket on it and put some gook and pucky on the gasket and put the bolts in, tighten them down and everything. I got a plastic bag around it now just to keep any dirt and crap from going in there. And then these studs where they stick out here, sometimes they catch on a guy's hand when he's trying to reach in there. You don't have much room between the, the firewall and the back of this engine and the mount and all the stuff that's on here. So reaching down in here to change the timing, to, these are the bolts, you got to unloosen the nuts, you have to unloosen to unloosen the magnetos to adjust the timing and, and uh, some of the other things in here, you're always reaching down in there to do that kind of stuff. 
So I took those studs where they stick out and I just took a little bit of RTV and put on them to kind of protect them, keep from tearing up skin on them and stuff. I got a new piece of hose to go on here. This is the, yeah, come on off there. It won't come off there now. I had it off a while ago. There it is. Uh, this is where the breather tube hooks on and there's just a hose that hooks on for a coupling that goes between here and the breather tube. The breather tube comes out and goes down. So I got a new hose to, to fit on that for that coupling. So now I gotta let this stuff cure up a little bit before I fool with it anymore. And I still got a couple of parts coming. I got some stuff that should be here tomorrow. It said it got here today at the post office today, so they didn't have it out yet. Um, and then there's some stuff that should be here within the next few days for that primer line. Anyway, let's see what else I can do. Oh, I can, I gotta put this fitting in here. This is where the fitting goes for the oil cooler here. I think I said before that this was it, but this is where the tachometer goes. This is the fitting here for the oil cooler hose. So I've gotta take the plug out of there and put the fitting in there. And then the other fitting is right down here. Another plug is right down here. That one's gotta come out and that fitting put in there. Anyway, I've got to get that stuff done, so I've got to wire brush some of that stuff to get it cleaned up, so I've got to go put a new wire brush on my grinder.